Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this Oxford University History Society talk. We're very happy today to welcome Moshe Benhamo, who is a third-year DPhil candidate in politics um, at Oxford's DPIR. Um, Moshe studied for um, has a background in politics and international relations. He holds a BA in international relations from ITAM in um, in Mexico. Um, an MA in political science from the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and an MSc in Latin American studies from Oxford. He's previously worked for um, Mexican Ministry of Social Development and done consulting work for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Broadly speaking, um, he, he's interested in the intersections between criminal violence and politics, state repression, political behavior, and criminal and civilian agency, and conducted research on foreign policies and their intersection with the small arms trade. So Moshe, today you're gonna to talk to us about your uh, default research on the social responses to criminal violence in Mexico. Yeah, well, thank you, Jacob. I'm really happy to be with you guys and this evening in Oxford, morning for me. And so I'll just share my screen really quick. And let me see. So can you hear, can you see the screen? Yeah, great. So as Jacob mentioned, um, this is my DPhil project, uh, which I'm currently in the stage of writing the dissertation. I already conducted the field work and the quantitative work. So at this time, I'm only, you know, analyzing all the data, uh, you know, transcribing the interviews, trying to make sense of it all and, and trying to come up with, with something. So if you guys want, we can talk not only about the research per se and the topic, which I know it's a little bit niche, uh, but also we can talk about, you know, the process of research. How does it look like from a default perspective? And perhaps some of you are interested in that. So I'm very happy to talk about that too. So. Let me give you a little bit of background. Sorry, Jacob, just one thing. Uh, in terms of time, uh, how long should I take? Um, sure. So we, I think we, we arranged like an hour in an hour in total. So how split it, however, um, how we, we be most comfortable if you want to go slightly under. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. So let me give you a little bit of background. So probably some of you have heard of what's going on in Mexico through you know, Netflix series like Narcos or perhaps in some movies or in, in the media, perhaps. Uh, but the, the reality is that some of those things get misinterpreted. So let me just give you a little bit of background. It's a really, you know, complex story, but Mexico uh, was not always as violent as it is now. There has always been, been some violence, of course, but uh, what Mexico has experienced since the mid 2000s is different. And why is it different? Because um, most of us now agree that uh, the strategy that the former president uh, Felipe Calderón launched in 2006 to combat um, drug trafficking, the so called war on drugs, really led to what we're seeing today, which is incredible. Um, rates in homicides and forced disappearances and a lot of crimes that really can be comparable or even higher than you know that of civil wars like Syria or Afghanistan. So why did this happen? Why did the strategy launched by the president incentivize more violence? So there are several explanations out there, but uh, the most, uh, let's say, recognized or the consensus is around two main explanations. First, that when the government targeted these criminal organizations, these big cartels that we used to have, they, they fragmented into smaller uh, organizations, which became more predatory because they started competing with, with each other. So that competition um, led to them to, to become more violent as, as they were fragmented uh, with the government targeting. The second is a diversification of criminal portfolios. What that means is that as the government started to crack down on drug trafficking, 
uh, it became more costly to engage in that, those activities. So criminals were trying to, you know, to to deploy other tactics or to engage in other illicit activities, for example, extortion, illegal logging, illegal mining, uh, etc. So they be, they widen their their criminal activities because the you know the more specific drug trafficking was really being targeted by the government. So though you know these we, we can learn from this that you know government policies do have effects. And the effects in this case were pretty negative. So a result, as a result of the, all this violence and the diversification of criminal portfolios, um, we do see an increase in civilian victimization. So people are starting to get more targeted, not only petty crime, but you know, really high-level crimes like kidnapping, extortion, raping, etc. So as you can see in the graph, the homicide rate almost doubled and reached levels that were not seen in Mexico. So as of now, okay, we see that people are getting victimized, but how do people respond? There's a there's an emerging literature on what's called civilian agency in conflict settings. So how do civilians, you know, act when they are uh, suffering all, all these all these crimes? Because it's not always the government that responds to them. They are the ones that are in the daily living of this, you know, horrible situation. So they they respond. So. There are several theories that account for why they respond in one way, way or another, but some of them agree that pe people have different choices. For example, some of them can, as Hirschman labeled it, they can exit, so they can migrate or they can be internally displaced. Uh, some people accommod accommodate, you know, to the presence of this criminal organization, so they change their like, you know, they, they routines. They perhaps uh, don't go out at night as much as they used to. So, so they engage in all these behaviors without really, you know, fleeing or, or, or so. So the third option that is the case that I'm studying is resistance. So actively confronting the threat that these criminal organizations pose to them. So in terms of resistance, there are two main options that people engage in. So individual or collective resistance. I'm I'm also studying collective resistance, and within collective resistance, there is violent resistance and non-violent resistance. What does violent resistance mean? Um, for example, vigilantism, which is the the really core that I'm studying, or lynching. So engaging in violent methods to prevent the threat of crime, and non-violent resistance. It can be described as, for example, protests. Uh, hunger strikes, uh, roadblock blockades, so, you know, nonviolent methods to pressure the government in order to take some action. So let's, let's get moving forward. Um, so what is the motivation of my study? Uh, social responses are largely understudied. Social responses to criminal violence are largely understudied. So we, we have a lot of knowledge on social responses to violence in context of civil war. And that's where most of the literature has developed. But in context of large scale criminal violence, which is a case in Mexico, we, we have less knowledge. So I'm trying to fill that sort of gap in the literature. And also there's a growing, uh, re there's growing research on civilian agency violence settings. So not only you guys that are in the history society, it's not only contemporary conflicts, for example, there's a lot of new research on the Holocaust and how different, uh, and how Jews deploy different strategies of resistance, you know, against this mass violence that was deployed, like, deployed against them. So there's a lot of also historical research on how civilians react in context of violence. So as in, I was saying, uh, there's not much on criminal violence. So I'm trying to test some of the findings that the literature has uh, uh, developed uh, in the civil war literature. In, to my case. In this picture, you can see one of the vigilante groups that, that, that I'm studying. Mm. So what, what is the research question? Why do some communities mobilize against criminal violence? And what are the factors basically that are shaping this, this mobilization, whether it's violent or non-violent? So here, uh, so what, is, what are the defenses? Our defenses are like militias that, you know, groups of citizens form 
in order to, to fight crime. So they basically circumvent the, the state uh, in order to, to fight crime and they engage in their own methods to do so. So what, what, what you can see in this map is uh, the growth of, of this uh, phenomenon. So the phenomenon really has always existed in some form in Mexico. Mostly there were indigenous communities that were performing this type of collective action to protect themselves. But in 2013, in the context of this war on drugs that I'm mentioning and increased levels of violence, uh, we do see uh, you know, a skyrocketing in the, in the emergence of vigilante groups. So they were concentrated, as you can see, mainly in the southern west coast of Mexico in 2013, in mainly two states, Michoacan and Guerrero. And then by 2017, you know, we almost see them in every state in Mexico. So we, there is an expanding, you know, wave uh, of these groups. Uh, if you haven't seen it, the movie Cartel Land will really illustrate how these groups look like and what are they, how are they fighting criminal organizations and what are they doing? So I, I, I recommend that movie uh, if you guys are interested in, in this. So uh, basically what I'm trying to, to study is why are they, in. So I'm trying. I'm trying to study three aspects of this group. So why are they emerging? What are the trajectories they have, and what are the consequences of their appearances? With you guys, I'm going to discuss the, the emerging aspect. So why do they emerge in some places, but not in others, basically? Um, so what what does the previous research on this type of groups tell us? Res uh, so this phenomenon was um, sorry. This phenomenon was mostly studied by sociologists and criminologists, but recently within political science, perhaps also in history, there, there has been a, an upsurge in interest on why these groups emerge. And these groups are obviously not specific or unique to Mexico. So they, uh, we see vigilante groups in, in the pre-Civil War United States, in post upper high South, South Africa, in post-Civil War Guatemala, we see them nowadays in Nigeria, the so-called Bekazi boys. We see them basically all, all over Latin America, the Rondas Campesinas in Peru. So it's not a phenomenon unique either to Mexico or Latin America, but it's really widespread. So we, we do see them a lot. In Mexico, there has been several explanations uh, given by political scientists mostly. So. For example, uh, Phillips argued that in places where insecurity, uh, where, sorry, where the inequality is higher, we do see the emergence of these groups more. Why? Because there's a security gap between rich and poor people. So these, these people that are engaging in vigilantism, they want to shorten the security gap. Others argued that migration or remittances, uh, you know, are helping these groups form. Why? Because Really, in some rural areas in Mexico, there is not many resources to, to, to form these groups. You know, you need arms, you need transport, you need a lot of resources to mount the resistance. So they are getting the money basically from the United States. So the, in this research, they identified that where there are there is more remittances, you, you see a, likely, a higher likelihood of vigilantism. And also, there's an explanation of the long-term legacies of history. And this is something that I will speak more about because I'm really interested in this. So basically, the, the issue here is that in areas where there was previous experiences of armed mobilization, for example, in the Cristeros War in the 1920s, or in the re post-revolution, or in the 1970s with, with the guerrillas, we do see that there are some legacies that you know uh, are transmitted through, throughout the generation. I will get into this question later because this is something that I, I really think it's true and something that I discovered in my field work, but just to let you know how history plays also a role in this in this topic. So this is perhaps a boring thing, but I will still tell you a little bit more about the data and the methods that I've been using. So my research is a mixed methods research design, which means that I'm using both quantitative data and qualitative data. The quantitative component of my research uh, is basically a statistical analysis. What I did is I coded uh, incidents of vigilantism uh, from 2013 to 2017. So I coded over 500 incidents of vigilantism 
by municipality. In those incidents, uh, I put them in a data set and I put also several variables, for example, some of the ones that I mentioned, like inequality, levels of crime, historical legacies. And I see basically see which variables makes, you know, are statistically associated with the emergence of these groups. It's, it's what the statistical analysis tells us. And in the quantitative, qualitative component in the second part of the research, I'm basically trying to see the mechanisms by which uh, these groups emerge. So having, you know, a, a hunch of what's happening with the statistical data, I'm trying to make sense of that, those findings by interviewing people, by doing participant observation. Those were the two main uh, uh, types of research that I did. So I did like 60 interviews with uh, leaders and members of vigilante groups. And also I, I did some participant observations to see how they, they react. And also I interviewed citizens, journalists, academics to, to, to have a look, like a wider perspective of, on what's going on. So now onto the findings. Um, vigilante groups are present in almost 10% of Mexican municipalities, which is a lot. So imagine, 10% of the UK having a vigilante group in their municipality. It's a, it's a lot. So I think that's really impressive. And to the degree, uh, you know, of how people are resisting crime in Mexico. I also see that it's mainly a rural phenomenon. So it happens 40% more in rural, in rural communities rather than urban communities. And I think th this is something that's probably uh, not surprising, uh, but we could talk more about that if you guys want. And also, it's not necessarily clustered in indigenous communities. So there was a notion that, you know, there are some cultural explanations saying that because indigenous communities have their own methods or traditions of self-defense, they will probably have those traditions, you know, uh, pass through the generations and they would deploy them uh, against any outside threat, including crime, but I didn't see that. Um, so let me talk to you about talk to you about the three main like statistical results that I found. So what's the relationship between homicides and the emergence of these groups? Basically what I found is an inverted U relationship. What does this mean? When there are little levels of homicide, there is a little uh, probability that we will see a vigilante group emerge. When there are really high levels of homicides and we're talking really high levels, so more than any war, more than anything you can see where there are really high levels of homicides. Also, we don't see a lot of these groups emerge. We see them emerge like an, in a moderate level of homicides because traditional social, move, social movement theory would say here that when mobilization is redundant or very costly, it doesn't make sense to, to organize. And also the cost may be prohibitive to organize. So there is a, like a sweet spot or a middle point where, where not only these type of groups be this, but social mobilizations is likely to emerge. And this, this research comes a lot from the, you know, the protest in authoritarian settings. So when in authoritarian settings where repressions is really high, we don't see as much mobilization. And also when there's really low, we don't see it, but there's a middle ground where, where, where this happens. And I think in this case, it's a similar thing between homicide rates deployed by criminal organizations and vigilantism. Second, and this also confirms some of the theories out there, is about cartel presence. When there is no cartel in a municipality, so there are no criminal organization, we, not, we almost see no vigilante groups, which makes sense. Like, why would you form a vigilante group if there is no threat of organized crime? When there is one cartel, we, we see them, but less so. So, no, sorry, we we'll see them more than when there is no cartel, but not to high degrees. Why? There is a theory in political science that uh, whenever there is a group, either in civil wars or in criminal wars, whenever we have a group that monopolizes violence, they don't need to deploy as much violence towards the population. And we can talk more about if this is true or not, but here the sense is that when there is one group that has the monopoly of violence, there is no need to victimize the population as much. But whenever there is two or more groups in a municipality, this likelihood increases considerably. Why? Because when groups are competing for territory, their 
time horizons shortened. So they, they don't know if they will be present you know, in the next year and the next five years. So what does this mean? It means that uh, they don't need to rely as much on the population, you know, they don't need them to be liked as much. So they can basically predate on them, they can extort them, they can uh, rape the women, etc. Why? Because uh, they, they don't have this reliance on the population because they know that they might be gone in the next few years with the uh, cartel in fighting. So basically that's the second finding. The third one is about historical legacies. So basically what I did is, here is a statistical analysis comparing violent and nonviolent mobilization and to see whether they were associated with previous forms of mobilization and resistance. I did so by looking at the municipalities that had experienced mobilization in the 1920s in Mexico, in the 1940s and the 1970s, and see if there was an association between those that nowadays have vigilante groups. And we do see that. We do see that in municipalities that had cristeros, municipalities that have rural militias or left-wing guerrillas in the 1970s, there is a higher likelihood of mobilization nowadays. So the question, it's very good to have the results, but now how do we explain the, the legacies and how they're transmitted? So this is where the qualitative component of the research comes in. And maybe you guys here have some, you know, feedback because this is what I'm really trying to put up in these few months that I'm writing my dissertation. So what are the mechanisms that I, I do believe that are influencing this historical transmission? Weapons availability, of course, like when you ask people there, like, do you guys have weapons? Uh, do you guys, how do you get, how do you source the weapons? Because, you know, getting a weapon is not easy. Although in Mexico it's easier because we have the border with the United States. So there's a lot of gun trafficking, but still, like, if you ask the about the prices of illegal weapons, they are in the thousands of dollars. So many of these communities uh, are not able to access those weapons. So what they have told me is that in many cases they they had weapons since you know since years before, and so this is where I make the link between previous rounds of mobilization. So they had weapons in their house. For, for some of them, for example, for agricultural activities. Uh, some of them told me that I had a weapon to kill like iguanas that you know that are, are in in the crops, but still, like when you have a weapon, you can use it either for agricultural activities or for self defense. So having weapons transmitted from previous rounds of mobilization or armed conflict, uh, I think it's an essential component, especially for for communities that have low access to to new weapons. Tactical know how. This is also really important. How do groups of citizens, you know, that have really no tactical training, that have very low experience in combat, how are they able to defeat, in some cases, many, in many not, but in some cases, how are they able to defeat these powerful criminal organizations that, you know, employ the latest weapons with the highest technology? How are they able to do so? And what I found in the interviews is that they have a lot of tactical know-how and knowledge, and that is derived also from, from experiences in the past. For example, they told us that they know the terrain really well, or their fathers told them how to use weapons, or, they or their parents told them uh, how to, to move from one place to another. So all this tactical know-how um, is important, uh, and it's also explanatory on why these groups are having success in some cases to fight and to organize. And also there is the part of organization. So organizing people, it's not easy, but if you have the previous experience of organizing, that can make things easier. Third is the role of violent entrepreneurs. So what are violent entrepreneurs? These are many of these groups, I would say most of them, if not all of them, have rally around a really important or central figure, uh, which is able to finance, organize, and maintain the efforts of mobilization. So these bio entrepreneurs basically are people or individuals that uh, favor the use of violence to, you know, to, for dispute resolution. And many of these violent entrepreneurs are also 
can be linked to history, the, their attitudes, because for example, many of them, I interviewed them, you know, the leaders of these groups, and they told me, oh yeah, my father used to participate in the rural militias. And he always talked about his experiences and he always told us how we should defend ourselves. We should not rely on the government. Um, he also told us to use weapons, etc. So there's also a link there between, you know, how bioentrepreneurs are, you know, are created in some way and how they are able to use their experience in order to mobilize people. Finally, the fourth explanation that I'm looking at is normative availability. What does this mean? It's basically a cultural explanation, meaning that in some places, taking up arms to solve problems is just more accepted than in others. So probably if in an urban neighborhood in Mexico City, there's a sudden spike in crime, I don't think the main, the first reaction would be, oh, let's arm, so arm ourselves and let's form a group. And whenever there's a new crime, we, we will stop the criminals. So normative availability means that in some places that have had experiences of armed fighting, cur current, you know, mobilization is explained. So it's easier for people to mobilize and accept that this is a feasible solution. Basically, that's what I mean with that. So these are like the four mechanisms I'm hypothesizing in terms of historical transmission of, of these past conflicts. Uh, and just to finish, I think I took like um, 25 minutes already. So we still need a better understanding of civilian collective actions, uh, especially in settings affected by criminal violence. So we need to know how civilians are responding. So civilians are the ones that are suffering all this violence. So we need to know how are they responding on a day-to-day -day basis and also what are the impacts of, of their responses. So when civilians form a vigilante group or when civilians protest, those you know, forms of action have re different repercussions. Some papers now have showed that when civilians respond with violence, more violence ensues. So civilians are not always the victims, of course, because they, they can also you know, spark more violence. And this is the case with many, many of the vigilante groups that I was talking about. Second, um, in this case, many studies have emphasized the importance of single factors, for example, socioeconomic factors, historical legacies, in explaining this, this phenomenon. But I'm saying that it's a multifactorial explanation that we need. That, it includes both contemporary explanations or factors and also historical factors. We, we need to include both in order to understand what's driving the, the emergence of these groups. So as I said, I identify both, both criminal, criminal dynamics, so the presence of criminal groups or cartels by municipality and also the homicide rates, as well as historical determinants uh, as potential you know, explanations of why we see these wave of vigilante groups in Mexico. Basically, that's it. And I hope hopefully you find it interesting and we can talk or discuss about any, you know, specific or substantive part of the research or also about the experience of, of doing this type of research. Thank you. Thank you so much for um for that presentation. Um I I wanted to to maybe kick off kind of in the back of my mind, um, you mentioned at the beginning just how how possible it is to to compare the Mexican um, social responses to violence to 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 not only um, other contexts in Latin America but globally and far and far further back um, different historical examples. I mean, I had in the back of my mind the kind of context of southern Italy of of Sicily, um, and and I want to kind of link it to to the idea of trust. Um, you mentioned kind of one of the the historical factors, um, violent entre entrepreneurs, and mm -hmm. the uh, um, and the kind of role of personality in um, in generating in generating a kind of impetus for mobilization. If you have a particular um, lead, natural leadership figure in a particular municipality, and they might draw on, they might draw on a historical legacy. Um, so when it comes when it comes to to, the, to those figures, could you discuss maybe the, the 
the particular socioeconomic or or other or other personal dimensions that you the, the maybe some of these people you interviewed and also connected to kind of trust in other local institutions say the judiciary um or uh, or maybe the, the local church presence in these in these municipalities so why why do certain um entrepreneurs prove more successful than others um in in rallying people sure no oh, great question um i think uh, this is um uh, so many of these groups are you know patron led groups so basically there is a Cacique, which you know, uh, uh, you know a lot of, you know about them a lot. So caciques are like local political chiefs and people that have not only economic but also political resources at their disposal. So many of these people are employing a dual strategy. Basically, what that means is that they are um, using these groups not only to defend the community, but also to defend their property. So these people have, for example, ranches or industries or agricultural, you know, terrains that need to be protected. Also because these are the most targeted by the criminal groups. So I think economics play an important role in, the, in, this, in this story because they have the capacity and the need to, to protect their their property and they use uh, these economic resources to buy weapons to mobilize people and they also have uh, you know as I, I mentioned political and uh, capital in the city so they are looked up to in many cases for example in this municipality that it was one of the first to rise up against crimes there is this cacique uh, called el abuelo so you could google him uh, and he he's when you visit him and you, you you talk to him, he's basically like an article, like a criminal, you know, like a criminal. He has a big mansion and he has his, uh, you know, his guard, but all the people in town respect him because he was able to form this, you know, self-defense groups and he has provided um, security, which was not present before. But this doesn't mean that you know their interests of these bio entrepreneurs are always benign. So they have they may have you know be really self interested, but at the same time they're creating a social good for the community. In terms of trust, and this is like something that also has been um, researched before. So, what actually one study found that in places where vigilantism occurs there is a dual relationship between trust. So there is little trust on in institutions or you know, on government institutions, on democratic institutions, but there are really high levels of interpersonal trust. So people really trust their communities, people really try to trust their neighbors, even perhaps churches, or, but really local institutions, but not you know, federal or state level institutions. And this makes sense because in order to join a group that potentially is going to cost you your life, you have to trust your peers and you have to know them. So I think in that sense, I can answer the issue of, of trust. Thanks so much. I, I think following on from that is maybe the, the question then of, of the legitimation of, of these, of these um, self-defense groups. Um, as they kind of as they grow and as these entrepreneurs successfully mobilize people, how important say is it to present what they're doing as apolitical or as I'm, you mentioned the low levels of trust in institutions, but how explicit is that? And um, I, I, I imagine the country like Mexico, the the relationships between these groups, not only um, with um, with organized crime, but also the states and local police forces. That varies a lot, but is there anything? broad we can say about how they present their political or apolitical nature that's a great question because one of the groups um that i've been studying more it's a group in the mountain of guerrero so this rural area that has been historically characterized by rebellion so in the 1960s and 70s in this state uh, there were numerous and important 
guerrilla, left-wing guerrilla movements and social movements that were really, really harshly rep rep repressed by the state uh, in the so-called dirty wars that not only happened in Mexico, but also in other places in Latin America, people were forcibly disappeared, etc. So there is, people nowadays know what happened. They're really still traumatized by those events. And when I ask this vigilante group, uh, basically it's a community police system uh, or network there, and that it's really important. When I ask them about the, their political aims or their ideology, they, they basically responded that they had none because they didn't want to be persecuted by the state. The state uh, really fears these you know, ideologically driven or politically driven groups. For example, the Zapatistas in the 1990s, I don't know if you've heard about them, but they were also confronted by the state because they had this ideology of, of separating or even you know, replacing the state. So in this case, they, they really try to remain apolitical uh, to avoid the government persecution. And they, they state that in this case, their only aim is to you know, provide security, to restore security conditions to what they were before. But they rarely make political you know, declarations and they really confront, rarely co confront the government because they know the government is much more powerful and they can be disarmed or persecuted very, very easily. So they have adopted this discourse of security and try to remain apolitical in order to, to, to avoid confrontation. So I wanted to ask now about your um, participant observation, your, your field work um, and entering, entering these um, these these municipalities um, as as an academic researcher. So how 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 did this this vary? How did you first, I guess, practical question, go about contacting them, and how did how did they they respond? Maybe you can connect that to how they yeah how how, how they interact with that with publicity with scrutiny from say journalists or academics in particular. Yeah, no, that's that's also a really good question. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, especially for I mean, for people who are not really, uh, and that includes myself, uh, knowledgeable about you know how does this work in practice. So I have to say that in, in the first time I arrived, I came by myself uh, naively. So I drove to this place, which was like six hours from Mexico City, really far, uh, and just came there. And I knew they were there. And I stopped and I say, hi, I'm a student from Oxford University. Can I please interview you guys? Because I'm really interested in what you're doing. And they were really like suspicious at first. And then they, you know, they chatted among themselves and then they said, oh yeah, no worries. But obviously this doesn't work like that in every case. And there are places which are more, much more complicated and much more insecure. And I was also really scared, you know, that something would happen because I don't want to give you many stories, but in many of these places, after I've left, there have been really a lot of incidents of violence. So it's really hard in that sense. The, after that, I started taking a more, you know, I would say safe approach. And I started, for example, contacting journalists. Journalists, especially local journalists, have a lot of knowledge on, you know, on the current political situation and even the security situation in all levels. So what I did is I contacted uh, local journalists that I knew wrote about criminal issues and some of them knew these guys personally. So they, some of them were really nice and they got, took me to, to, to talk to them. Um, another way sometimes is to have a government official help you, but that can get really messy because although they, incredibly so, they they know the vigilante groups and they have a relationship with them, uh, you know, the local politicians. But uh, when you include the political factor, then 
you know, things can get like, oh, why are you talking to this politician? Why are you coming with him? So I would say that the strategy that worked for me the most was talking to journalists and having them help me to con contact them. And also they, they're able to say, okay, this guy is an academic, he's not, a, you know, because they're really suspicious and for good reason that, you know, uh, they can get infiltrated or something. So if you have someone that refers you and talks, you know, uh, good about you, I think that can help. But also sometimes you, if you have no contacts, you just have to make a contact and then that contact gives you another contact. So it's called like the snowball approach where, where you're, you have to start somewhere, but that's, that really takes you off to, to meeting new people. But I would say that uh, it's not easy, especially doing re field research in settings of violence is not easy. And there are a lot of ethical and security considerations that need to be taken into account. So I, I wanted to ask a bit about um, maybe the reception of your um, of your work in, in Mexico um, versus in in, set, in academic settings um, elsewhere. Maybe, and maybe how how you hope this work could impact or um, maybe policy policy developments or what, how 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 have say Mexican media and political um, political forces negotiated kind of perspectives such as yours coming in with, with these academic vision is there is it a receptive climate or not or is or is it difficult to generalize so that was it was really weird that for the first time in my life I got a journalist that contacted me because I I wrote a blog for for CIDE which is a university in Mexico it was called the landscape of uh, self-defense groups in Mexico so I was basically saying how there are many types of groups. Some of them have alliances with organizations. Some of them are independent and we really need to study them individually to know what's going on. So I, I posted that blog and I thought, okay, that's it. I'll get like a few views and that'll be it. Then two weeks later, I got an email from a journalist uh, in Puebla, which is a state in Mexico. And he was saying, oh, I read your blog. I really need to, to interview because this event happened uh, two weeks ago. And what happened is that the guy, the leader of this huge self-defense group called uh, Fuerza Territorial Poblana, he was killed in a confrontation with a criminal group. And I interviewed him a month ago or so. So I was the last person to interview him. And so, they, really, they were really interested in what I thought about them, what would ensue, because as I said, these groups are rally around these really important or really charismatic uh, figures. And they were really fearful of what would go on with that group after their leader was gone. So they, they, thought they, they asked me about that. So I think, uh, uh, I mean, we academics have, a lot to bring to the table for policy discussions and for um, not only for academic discussions, but also for policy, especially those of us that have done field work. We, we, we know the field, we know the conditions uh, and we are not biased as many government officials. So I think we can bring a lot to the table in that sense. And I think the work has been in most places has been receptive quite, quite well. Although since, and this happens a lot with academia, uh, it's not a current topic in terms of, it's not being you know discussed in the media all the time. And it's not being you know discussed in policy uh, currently because it's, I don't know, it, it had a lot of attention in the 2013, 2014. And after that, it has gone un under the radar. But still, it, it happens, it exists, and people live it daily. So I think we have the challenge as academics to how to present our research as relevant, right? Because 
if something doesn't happen, like the event that I told you that this guy was killed, uh, it's hard to to present our research as something that is relevant because, especially in history, I would say, like for example, those that study Ukraine probably didn't have anyone ask them about the research for a long time until you know the war. So how to before these events happen, how to make our research relevant? I think that's a challenging and somehow you know difficult topic. I'd like to ask now about kind of maybe the, the comparisons between Mexico and other countries in um in 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 Latin, Latin America. Um, I think I think there's 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 a tendency, right, particularly in non Latin American non Latin American media coverage, to to speak about waves of kind of political change or or social change um, in in the region. So I I'm kind of asking in like the say the Colombian election and um and this this kind of radical change approach from um Gust Gustavo Petro and and trying to to reach out to to different um armed groups in a different in a different way negotiate in a different way um how how much of an impact do you think a development in one country can have on maybe in, in Colombia could have on the way the state in Mexico negotiates with these armed groups, or is there something you'd like to comment about how significant you, you think this this development might be? Sure, no, I, I think totally there is an influence on on you know the developments in certain countries or other countries. I mean, the influence of U.S. policy in Mexico and the war on drugs is undeniable. And also, for example, uh, nowadays a lot of people are speaking about how Mexico, so Colombia used to be like Mexico in the 1980s and now Mexico is like Colombia in terms of violence. And a lot of people are trying to learn from the experiences and trying to implement some of the successful policies because now Colombia is much more or less violent than Mexico. In regards to, to you know, negotiating with these type of actors, I think it's much more feasible to negotiate with politically oriented actors such as rebel groups like the FARC and so on. And the, the issue of negotiating with criminal organizations is a very taboo topic. Uh, for some reason, even if that would improve conditions uh, in Mexico or anywhere else, it's viewed as morally incorrect to negotiate with criminal organizations, even though that could have the ultimate result of, you know, of improving the lives of people. Because, you know, what we're experiencing in Mexico right now, it's uh, it's terrible in terms of violence. So, in that sense, I I'm not sure if if you know what's going on in Colombia and the, the increasing negotiations and talks would modify uh, would modify what's going on in Mexico because we're talking about really two different types of actors. So there have been you know initiatives uh, but really stayed at a very low level and and whenever someone you know raises the topic of oh maybe we should create a truce or you know or have some, have some sort of negotiation, then every, everyone has a moral panic. And I don't think that that will be feasible in Mexico's case. So we, we don't know what awaits us in terms of, you know, the future of political and criminal violence in Mexico. Thanks so much, um, Moshe. So we've got about 10 minutes um, remaining. I don't know if anybody, anybody else would like to, to jump in. In the meantime, I think um, I, I'd like I'd like to ask a bit about what you think the prospects for um for further research maybe in this in this area um could be. Is there? Yeah. Um. How 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 do you think um scholars should should engage engage with this methodologically and um in terms of expanding the kind of scale the scale of analysis, scope or scope or Sure. Um, 
so there's a lot of, uh, in terms of, I mean, if you refer to violence in Mexico or criminal violence in Mexico, there's a lot of research that emerged or surfaced uh, since the 2010s, but most of it has been quantitative and based on homicides, based on you know certain data that is more accessible and reliable. And now there has been a turn where people are saying, this is a very local phenomenon. So we really have to understand local dynamics in order to make sense of what's going on in each place. So the first you know, wave of research was very you know, quantitative and cross national oriented, like studying Mexico as a whole. And the new wave, which is in the last few, three, four, five years, is studying you know, doing ethnography, for example, doing archival work, doing really localized research that helps us understand dynamics, but at the local level, at the municipality level. Nowadays, people are, are doing research at the block level to understand how, how these dynamics work. And also, I think we need, a, in this case, and that's what I'm trying to do, a multidisciplinary type of research. So not only relying on one discipline, for example, my, my discipline is political science, but sociology, anthropology, ethnographies, and archival work. I think that's where the work is going, not only mine. So integrating different approaches to make sense of what's really a, a, a complex issue. That's what I think. Okay. Thanks so much. So I think um I think I I I I'd like to ask you how maybe maybe a kind of personal question. Um <laughs> what what your future future plans are. I mean, you're wrapping up, up the diesel. Um how would you yeah, how what kind of life would you like this research to take on and where 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 do you <laughs> plan on going next if I can ask that? Yeah. No, it's a, I think it's it's something that I'm asking myself at the moment too. It's hard because um you know, the academic job market is complicated. It's not easy to, to get a job, a decent job uh, in academia nowadays. Uh, but what I really like about Oxford DFIL is that you, so differently from an American PhD, uh, Oxford, I think, allows you to have a more wide a range of options in terms of what to do after the DFIL. So it's not only academia. Uh, and I see this with my peers, uh, that uh, I would say maybe half or less than half of them end up being academics. Others go on to, you know, to consultancies, think tanks, research centers, even, you know, firms. So you can do a lot about with your, you know, experience. I mean, perhaps the topic it's not you know relevant for firms, but the experience with field work, with analyzing different sources of data, interviewing people, you know, operating in a really complex environment, that can help. Uh, those skills are helpful for different types of jobs. So in my case, I think it, if I don't really get an academic job that I am happy with, uh, I can use the skills that I've gained throughout my research. And to to work for, for I would really like to work, for example, for a think tank that you know makes policy reports, or you know maybe a international organization like the ICRC, the UN that they do a lot of research in terms of violence, in terms of gun trafficking. So I think uh, some like my message here would be that if someone is doing a DFIL or wants to do a DFIL. It's not only to be an academic, it's to pursue a research project entirely by yourself, which is really difficult. And after that, all that experience, you can apply to, to many different places, many different industries. And so I think uh, if what's you know, blocking you from doing a DPhil or a PhD is that you're not sure if you want to do academic work. Uh, I think that should not be an impediment because there are many options. 
Thanks so much, Washi. Um, so we're we're kind of drawing drawing to the close here. Um, yeah. So, I if anybody has any other questions, to either drop in the chat or not. If if not, then um, I think we can I think we can wrap up wrap up the recording. Thank thank you, Moshe, so much for uh, your time for the presentation. And for uh, and for your questions, I think I think it's left it's left us with that uh, with a lot of food for thought. Thanks so no, much. Th thanks, Jacob, for the invitation. Uh, I really appreciate it. Even though I know this topic might not be you know uh, familiar to a lot of people, I think still I think it's good to share sometimes you know random <laughs> talks. And also, I want to congratulate you on the all the work you're doing for the history society and as your role as an Oxford student because I think you're doing a great job and I wish you the best for your finals and for what's coming after that so thank you thank you all of you guys for being here and hopefully you have a good rest of the day thank you so much